Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Fridays with Vistage webinar. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some items to help you participate in today's webinar. If you're experiencing technical difficulties joining the webinar session, please dial support at 888-259-8414. When you join today's webinar, you selected to join either by phone call or computer audio. If for any reason you'd like to change your selection, you can do so by accessing your audio pane in your control panel. During the presentation, all participants will be in listen-only mode. Please note that a PDF of today's presentation is available for download on your control panel. A recording of this presentation will be sent to attendees via email within the next week. I would now like to introduce today's session led by Visage Chief Research Officer, Joe Galvin. Over to you, Joe. Thank you. Artificial intelligence has achieved the cult-like status of buzzword. It seems like everywhere you turn and every ad you hear uh, involves artificial intelligence in some way, shape, or form. And it's true. It's already penetrated into much of our daily lives. If you use Google Maps, if you shop on Amazon, if you listen to music on Spotify, you're already experiencing some of the end user benefits of artificial intelligence. But there's been a lot of hype around this. And I think to begin where artificial intelligence starts for many of us, uh, where it started for many of us is, is the voice of Hal from the 1968 classic 2001 A Space Odyssey. Uh, Douglas Raines, a Shakespearean actor, was that voice, and it was the first time we were exposed to this concept of machines being able to interact with us. 1984 saw us update that with the Terminator series, my personal favorite, and the concept of Skynet. This begins to shape our beliefs about what artificial intelligence is and isn't, and somewhere between the hype and the hope of artificial intelligence is what we hope to understand with the report that we published in association with our friends and partners, Salesforce, on artificial intelligence for small and mid-sized business. What we wanted to do was we wanted to understand what is artificial intelligence and what are the practical applications of it today. Our survey and our study looked at the fundamentals, really trying to understand, you know, what is artificial intelligence? What is that concept? How do I separate the noise and the hype from, from what it really means in terms of the small and mid-sized business world? I wanted to get into and we wanted to get into what are some real world use cases? How are people today in the small and mid-sized business segment actually actively using artificial intelligence and the capabilities that it can bring? And then working with the amazing experts we have that supported us on this project, uh, we want to create some recommendations for you. We want to create recommendations based on what you need to do to prepare for artificial intelligence in your future. It's clear that artificial intelligence is part of your future. It may not be tomorrow. It may not be next week, but it is coming. And our, our intent here was to help you gain better understanding as to what artificial intelligence is, how it's being used, but more importantly, how you can begin to think about preparing for that. To help us do that, we have a, a, an incredible panel that's joined us today who also contributed uh, to our report. Uh, Lee Blackstone, who is a longtime Vistage member, uh, owner and CEO of Blackstone and Cullen. Uh, they work with folks and have been working with folks since 1989 on data analytics business intelligence, and now artificial intelligence. So Lee, welcome to the broadcast. Thank you very much. Next, we are really fortunate to have Mario Castellano with us from Salesforce. Uh, Marco, Marco is the brains behind and the driver of Einstein, Salesforce's contribution to the AI world they've now embedded into their Salesforce applications and the Essentials product that they've launched specifically to the small and mid-sized business. So Marco, thank you for spending time with us today. Thank you. And, and fortunately, we are blessed to have Lori McCabe with us. Lori's a longtime friend of mine. Um, Lori McCabe and her, her group at SMB Group, they are to small and mid-sized business what Gartner is to the enterprise space in terms of understanding the technologies, the trends, the directions, the efficiencies, and the productivity that technology can blend. So, Lori, thank you so much for being part of our broadcast today. Thanks, Joe. Great to be here with you. Great. So before we, we tap into these the, the brains that we have assembled here today, I wanted to share with you how we got to uh, creating this report. It really started, as all of our research projects do, from requests and inquiries that come from our members and chairs. Four times a year, we poll the Vistage community, uh, and we ask a survey, our CEO confidence index. So that's a series of economic questions, but we always ask research questions. We asked a series of questions in June of 2018 uh, to begin to understand where and how artificial intelligence fits into the world of small and mid-sized business leaders. 
Um, we started by asking this question. Do you plan to invest in business software over the next 12 months? The response was overwhelmingly yes. 73.2% of respondents, and our response base here was 1,467 CEOs, business owners, and presidents, dominantly between one and $100 million in revenue size. 73% of them are making investments in, in software over the next 12 months. We then asked them, well, if you're going to be investing in, in technology, what are the software applications that you expect to invest in? And here we see at the top of the list, customer relationship management. Uh, CRM is clearly a critical role. Again, the capabilities that have been developed, uh, some of the, the great work that Salesforce has done in embedding Einstein into their capabilities has made getting closer to your customer, having your customer at the core of all that you do, uh, even more important than ever. I would call out uh, briefly that following behind that is cybersecurity. Close to a third of folks are investing in cybersecurity. While that's a story for another day, um, cybersecurity is a great threat to all small businesses. Uh, and again, we'll touch on that another time. But we found that CRM was, was that application where people were making investments. We then asked, which of the following advanced technologies do you feel will have the most impact on your business? Not necessarily investing or engaging, but how do you see these technologies evolving and impacting your business? At the top of the list is connected devices, Internet of Things. Uh, and we believe that a big driver behind that is the use of sensors and the ability to connect and add sensors to existing equipment, existing manufacturing capabilities, and use those sensors to draw data into your repository to make better decisions. Uh, but coming up right behind that is artificial intelligence and the use of artificial intelligence in the space. You'll see the other, uh, the other advanced technologies are all floating around the 10% or less range. So that drove us again to confirm that there is energy, there is activity when it comes to artificial intelligence. It was this question that really helped us out, and that was that we had asked a question, are you currently using artificial intelligence? And then if you did, the follow-on question was, in what areas are you currently leveraging artificial intelligence in your business? And what we found is a couple things. One, of our base of almost 1,500 uh, CEOs, 13.6% were actively using artificial intelligence, meaning it's not just a trigger event, but it's now starting to uh, go up the, uh, to, to begin to deliver value. And what we see are the key areas are one, business operations, again, consistent with the ability to update machines and machines capabilities to capture data without having to change out the entire machine and customer engagement. Again, that concept of CRM and how we can use technology to get closer, uh, can get, how we can use technology to get closer to our customers. So we found this interesting and this to be the foundation for our study going forward. Um, in our study, again, we wanted to understand the fundamentals and we wanted to get into real world use and some recommendations, but to get us going, let's get started with the fundamentals. What are the basics of artificial intelligence and what is it? How do we begin to understand that? And this is where I'm going to turn to our panel and Lori, I'm going to start with you. Lori, help us understand what artificial intelligence is and what that really means in the small and mid-sized business world. Yeah, well, I mean, I think artificial intelligence, and you can't talk about artificial intelligence today without also talking about machine learning, but it is just a huge wave of of new technology and a new way to do things. It's really going to impact, you know, not only technology, but every industry. I mean, a lot of people are kind of comparing this to, like, you know, the Industrial Revolution or the Internet. And I think it truly is that big. Um, but really, you know, in, in kind of layman's terms, artificial intelligence is kind of the science of building a system that can let you – collect and gather all the data that you're already collecting and, and also external data that you might want to use. And then using algorithms um, to kind of format that data and then come out with results and take action on the data. Um, so, you know, a, a perfect example that we can all relate to is something like Nest, which is a home monitoring device from Google. I mean, that they're basically gathering information about the conditions in your home and then you know, turning the heat up or turning the lights off or whatever based on some of the, what they're, what data they're taking in and how you've kind of set up the rules or in this case, you know, the algorithm, um, to take action. And then machine learning is the algorithms on top of that that let the computers learn and improve. So as, as you process more and more data and you have more and more inputs to look at, um, you can adapt and learn from the data. So a good example here 
is something like um, image recognition. So you may have to feed in uh, to a machine learning and AI program, you know, thousands and tens of thousands of images of cats and dogs and mice and rabbits. And, you know, keep correcting, but sooner, you know, sooner or later, they're going to be able to pinpoint with very, very high degree of accuracy, um, you know, what, what's the dog, what's the cat, what's the rabbit, et cetera. Um, but I think one of the, the really big things to remember, people are all behind building these systems and the algorithms. So um, the data is really, you know, kind of what fuels this thing. And, and AI is only as good, A, as the data you put into it. And B, as the people are at developing the models and the algorithms that are going to use that data to, to draw results and conclusions. Um, the only other thing I want to add in is that, you know, sometimes people say, well, what's the difference between AI and business intelligence? And I think the easiest way to kind of maybe um, explain that is like typical business intelligence and analytics kind of looks at data that you have and tells you what you what is happening with that data in the past. And you can model a little bit out into the future, but AI can, and machine learning, it lets you look at data in real time and helps you make predictions about the future as well. You know, Lori, it's interesting you mentioned, you mentioned the example of images. Uh, one of the folks that was on the panel when we presented this at Dreamforce back in September, uh, their company trains eyelash technicians, the people that apply false eyelashes. And as opposed to having a human visually look at each photo to determine the quality of the training, they've now been able to scan those images and have artificial intelligence begin to understand how to judge what is a good application of a false eyelash and a bad application. Uh, interesting that, that your example begins to dovetail into a real world uh, example that one company's doing. Uh, Lori, just yeah. a, a follow on as well. What does all this mean in the context of small and mid-sized businesses? I mean, these companies, they don't have, uh, we typically don't have large IT <laughs> right. certainly aren't in a position to hire data scientists. Well, Let's connect the dots there yeah. a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think the good news is that almost every single vendor from security vendors to business application vendors to hardware vendors, every vendor that we talk to, they are building AI and machine learning capabilities into their solutions. And I don't believe, except for all but maybe the very largest companies, um, most small medium businesses are going to use ad, uh, AI rather as a feature and a capability in the solutions they already know how to use. It's just going to make those solutions better. So a great example is, you know, you think of QuickBooks and two of QuickBooks, very small businesses is who they target, 20 and under. But they have already put a lot of uh, AI and analytic capabilities in to their applications to help those small businesses categorize, you know, expenses or get paid faster or, you know, identify um, maybe anomalies um, in, in different kinds of uh, transactions. So I think the good news for the small and medium businesses is the major technology vendors are building this in to their platforms and their solutions as capabilities and features so you won't need to bolt them on. And so it begins. AI begins to become real in small and mid-sized business. Marco, let me turn to you and ask you to help us. Help me understand, help us understand, how did we get here in terms of the evolution to this point? But more importantly, where do we go from here? Salesforce has always been on the front edge of, of embedding leading technologies into its capabilities, helping its, its customers move along faster. Help us understand how we got here, and more importantly, where we got to go. All right. Well, you know, we got here in large part through the power of the cloud. You know, there have been numerous industrial revolutions up to this point. Uh, by our count, three, the steam revolution, the electrical revolution, the computing revolution, and the AI revolution is largely powered by the cloud. And so Salesforce, as you know, is one of the one of the first to enter the cloud and to uh, to provide this notion of shared compute. But today, we have just vast quantities of compute at our fingertips and also data storage. I mean, people store tons and tons of data, petabytes of data, exabytes of data in Salesforce and AWS and Azure and all these other places that you can now use. So the cloud is really powering this fourth industrial revolution, which is AI. Now, as Lori said, yes, it's true that 
Many of the vendors, including uh, Salesforce, are including these artificial intelligence capabilities directly into our product. When it comes to SMB, small and medium businesses, uh, one of the biggest problems you have in trying to adopt artificial intelligence is data sufficiency. As a small business, you may not have all that much data, and so you may not have enough for artificial intelligence to train on. But one place where SMBs often have uh, a lot of data is in their marketing. So even a small or medium-sized business will often still have millions of email addresses and will send millions or even tens of millions of emails in any given month or quarter. And that's a lot of data. That's something that you can actually use. So here at Salesforce, uh, one of our most popular Einstein capabilities is built into our Marketing Cloud product. And people are using Marketing Cloud to send these emails out and stuff like that. And so uh, one company that's using it is Lids. Lids, you know, the hat company that you find at the mall and they sell all these different hats. And, you know, for their frequent users, their frequent buyers, they have a, a rewards program. And so they have lots of email addresses and they're sending emails. Now, in Marketing Cloud, uh, we are asking four very specific questions to predict. If I send you an email, are you going to open it? Number one, yes or no, are you going to open it? Number two, are you going to click through the email? Number three, are you going to convert? That is to buy or download the white paper, whatever you define as a conversion action. And number four, are you going to unsubscribe? So we ask these four questions. And when you turn this thing on, it predicts these four questions. And so the way that you use it is, well, whereas yesterday, let's say Lids might have had an email that they were going to send that says, I want to send this to men over 35 in California. Today, they can say instead, I want to send it to men over 35 in California who are more likely to open the email and less likely to unsubscribe. So that allows them to target their emails more predictively. And Lids in particular reports that their open rate has gone up four times. So they have four times more opens than they did before, and their click-throughs have gone up about two and a half times. But that's because they're sending less emails, because they're sending emails only to the people that are more likely to actually open it and click through it. That's what AI can do for you, uh, even as a small business. Well, well, Marco, it sounds like it's just the ability to add this advanced uh, data insight capability onto campaigns to go from micro-targeting to individual targeting. That's yep. right. Yep. Uh, sorry about that. I had a little mute issue. Uh, that's right. And, uh, you know, Liz is doing that to great, event, to great advantage. I often say that marketing is the on-ramp to <laughs> AI for most Excellent. businesses. Excellent. Well, Lee, let's shift to you now. Uh, and, Lee, can you share with us, uh, Lori touched on BI and AI a little bit, and your company works extensively in the data space and has for many years. Lee, can you give us some insight into uh, the difference between BI and AI and how that connects? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, for us, BI is really people looking in the rearview mirror and saying, what happened year over year? What happened month over month? What does our trailing 12 months look like? And so you can do a lot of fantastic things with business intelligence. It's also going to get back to the data. We keep going back. What is the data? What is the data? What is the data? And without good, solid data, you're going to have a problem getting good, accurate business intelligence and then next step, artificial intelligence tied to that. So what we're able to do as we begin to look at AI is we're begin, we can begin to do predictive models. So you may have heard of things like regression analysis, linear, nonlinear, uh, integer arithmetic, integer models. There's a lot of different things that you can look at. Some people say, well, I need a data scientist. Well, you may, there's functional data scientists and there's technical data scientists. And those are the same type of guys that would implement an ERP system for you. They're functional guys that help you define the business process and they're technical guys that will write the algorithms and make it work. My recommendation is go find one that's off the shelf, like a tool set with Einstein or a tool set that Microsoft has in their Azure workspace or Power BI or Tableau and use something that's already in the industry, preferably in the cloud, so you don't have to go and build a lot out. Then try it. Put a few people 
in your company in, in an area and let them begin to try to build some models. Some of the things that we've been able to do is we can now on a business to business scale, I can predict when a cup, what a customer is going to buy next. It's called next most likely purchase. It's been done a lot in the consumer space, but when you get into B2B space and you're dealing with deals that are north of $100,000, it gets to be really important that you don't waste your time. Another good application for artificial intelligence is to determine where somebody is not going to buy something. So I can make your sales force 80% more efficient if I tell you where they're not going to be, uh, where your customers are not going to be buying. So those are some of the other um, applications and, and a little bit on history of where this came from. If you take a look at closed loop manufacturing systems, process control, and my favorite example is you have a, a factory that produces toilet paper. There's a big wet glob of toilet paper at, at the end of the production line. How do you know what to do? Well, a good controls engineer has a closed loop control system that says, I've got to get the moisture out. There are 27 ways I can get the moisture out of that paper as it's running through the presses. I can, I can heat the rollers, I can squeeze more water out, I can run it faster, I can run it slower. I can turn the fans on. There's a lot of different things that you can do and AI is going to be very similar to that. It's just that over the years, the industrial side of the house has applied this to the industrial processes. And we're just now beginning to apply that same uh, background knowledge to the business side of the processes. Lee, what is it? What is it that a CE, a CEO needs to know about data that shows up from AI? Because it's different than the data that comes from my traditional predictive analytics. What is it that they need to prepare to understand how this data is different? A lot of the AI um, solutions are really good at solving one little small sliver of a problem, and they may want to go really deep in solving one small sliver of a problem. And and let me give an example. Uh, AI is really good for mate, for playing chess. You can have a great chess model and that's what it's really good at. And you may have another one that's really good at, at vision and another one that's really good at facial recognition. But when you tie all those together, they probably are not very good at landing an airplane, which is another AI system. So these things are not collected across a broad spectrum. And it's gonna be up to the CIO to step back and say, okay, what? class of problem am I trying to solve today with AI and can I do it and is it accurate and effective and it's going to be trial and error um, quite honestly and um, it's going to be a, a lot of arithmetic and a lot of trial and error but boy is it really powerful and if you think about it AI is AI um, until you do it one time and then it's just an algorithm that you can repeat over and over and over again. Well, well, Lee, you make it clear that I can't go out to the uh, technology store and buy me some AI. Whether it's an iterative process of getting my head around my data, having the capabilities and enough data, and then be able to ask the right questions to get information that I can make better decisions on. Right. Yeah. Well, great. Let's let's take a step forward now. Um, we talked about fundamentals, and, and Lori helped us understand what AI is and where it fits. Marco gave us some great examples of, of what people are doing and, and how we got here. And then Lee kind of connected the dots into some of the other areas where people are, are using this as they evolve down the data path. What was really curious to us as we set out on this study was, and one of the requirements that we had from the very beginning was, to help us understand what are people really doing today? What are real world applications of what we find small and mid-sized business leaders doing today? As you recall earlier from the chart, 13.6% of the respondents were actively engaged in some form, early form, of artificial intelligence. So I thought this next section would be, let's really understand where and how and what this means. So Marco, I'm gonna to come to you and ask you to talk to us, especially because you know the, the great respect that Salesforce has around the planet for its work with customer engagement. Uh, talk to us about how AI is really working and really happening in the customer engagement space. Yeah, well, you know, I talked about about lids earlier. And so uh, that's one of the customers that I think uh, exemplifies the how to get started with AI because they started with uh, some concrete questions. And so that's a key, right? You wanna start with some concrete questions. And as Lori alluded to, uh, you know, you wanna use the capabilities that are built into the products that you're already using. In the case of lids, that was uh, Marketing Cloud. In the case of another small business that we've been working with, Silverline Consulting, that was 
sales cloud. So our sales cloud is, you know, where a lot of people track their sales, uh, their leads, their opportunities, and so on. And there, uh, in the case of Silverline, they were getting a lot of leads in that they needed to prioritize. So even though they're a small business, uh, they generate a fairly remarkable amount of leads, and they don't have that many people to be able to work all those leads. They only have a few inside sales reps. So there, too, they had a very specific problem that they needed to solve, that being the prioritization of their leads. And they were using a tool, in this case, Salesforce, that happened to have something built into it, Einstein, which is our AI product, that allows them to prioritize those leads. So in general, start with uh, a question, a problem that needs solving, that you have enough data to solve. And ideally, uh, you know, although you can certainly use many of the tools that Lee alluded to, uh, it's always easier if it's already built into an app that you're already using, which increasingly is the case. Marco, how do people get over that um, that first step of saying, okay, I've, I've got a capability. Uh, how do I really get into it and get started? You alluded to it, but really, how do I start to crack that egg open? And then what does that mean as I begin to inject this new type of information uh, into the community? You know, one of the one of the things of, of Salesforce automation was we began to introduce new data and people weren't sure how to deal with that data. As this new information yeah. comes in, how do people begin to understand what it means and how to incorporate it? That's right. And, you know, certainly, in, incidentally, lead scoring, while it sounds simple, is exactly one of those things where, you know, when you introduce lead scoring, so how do you get into it? Well, I, I would say start by exploring the AI capabilities that are already present in the vendors that you're using, Salesforce and others. Look at what you've got available to you and look at where that matches with the data that you have. Like if in this case of Silverline, they had a large lead volume uh, and uh, the problems that you need solving. So that's how I would say you would get started uh, with that. But then, yes, there is a process there. So, you know, you in, in a lot of these tools, including ours, you can just turn these things on and they'll start working and they'll start making predictions for you. But that's just the beginning of the process, because, yes, it's true that uh, you need to instruct your users on how to use this, how to interpret this data. And you need to uh, help them build their trust in these predictions. So a lot of what we're doing, at least at Salesforce, is we, we devote a lot of our usability testing to uh, are we showing results and enough information that our users can trust the predictions that we're making. And so we, we spend a lot of our energy making sure that we're giving people the information they need to have that level of confidence in the predictions that we have. And you'll find that in a lot of the AI capabilities that are now pre-built into applications that you're already using. You'd mentioned the importance of concrete questions. Can you elaborate on what you mean by that? Because it's clear that the answer is only going to be as good based as the questions that you ask, right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. So, you know, Lee alluded to it earlier also in that there are different questions that you can ask of an AI system. You can ask a yes and no question, like lead scoring, uh, yes or no, is this lead going to convert or not? Or the email thing that I said earlier, yes or no, are you going to open the email or not? You can ask a numeric question, uh, you know, like how much is this deal going to close for? How much inventory am I going to have? Or you can ask other types of questions, like what category should this service ticket be in? But I will tell you that the more concrete the question is, the less potential answers you have, the more accurate your prediction will be. So yes and no question tends to generate the most accurate response because there are just really two potential answers there, yes or no. And so the kinds of questions you can ask, yes or no, is this customer going to attrit or not? Yes or no, is this lead going to convert or not? Those tend to produce the most accurate responses. So if you're looking for a place to start with AI, look for problems that fit that mold, that can be answered or reduced to a yes and no question because that will tend to produce the most accuracy out of the gate. Excellent. So as people begin, it's to look for uh, look for those yes and no answers or, or clear questions. And how long does it take for someone once they start to play with this before they're really able to get data that they trust? Because you've mentioned that was important. How long down that journey? Is, is it days, weeks, months? I mean, it totally depends on the application that you're using and the use case. So in the case of Marketing Cloud, for example, because of the way that that works and the fact that our users are very familiar with this tool that is audience builder that they make their filters and stuff, men over 35 in California, people that are using that, well, the predictions can take up to a day to build, at least in our system, but people often start using that right out of the gate. Whereas something like lead scoring or some of the other stuff that we're doing like predictive forecasting, 
where that has a human interface, it does take some time for users to understand that functionality because people interact with it directly and they need to build trust in it. And depending on the size of the business and the complexity, that can take weeks or months for users to build that trust. So it usually doesn't take more than a day or so for the machines to go build the predictions and everything like that, but it can take some time for users to build that trust. Wow, that's great. Thank you, Marco. Let's, let's shift over now and let's ask Lee. Lee, uh, you had some examples in customer engagement uh, as it relates to service, but, but talk to us about practical applications. What are people really doing with artificial intelligence that you intersect with? One of the coolest ones that I've seen recently is um, a recruiting system called Dice. And I know everybody's run across the problem. I need another Wayne or I need another Sally or I need another Mary. I need to clone this person. Well, uh, now in the Dice recruiting system, you can uh, copy someone's resume, drop it in the search engine, and it comes back with people that look like, act like, I'm not sure personality wise, but at least from the scoring engines that they've built into that, it really narrows down, narrow down your search time to about 10% of what it was prior to that engine being put in. And that's only been put in in the last couple of months in the Dice engine. So I see that as, is, is way cool. Um, some of the other things that you've seen in, in the real world, if you've been into an all inclusive resort recently or a cruise ship, you may be walking down the hall and it recognizes you and it says, well, hello, Joe, um, really great to see you. I know yesterday you were on the jet ski from two to four. Uh, this afternoon, parasailing's open from um, four to five. Would you like for me to schedule that for you? And would you like a Mai Tai on the way over? And what they're doing is they're, they're load balancing the assets and resources in those all-inclusive resorts. Um, and on the cruise ships and things like that. So there's predictions and, and prescriptions of uh, what you can do. Predictive, excuse me, prescriptive analytics is another interesting thing as part of artificial intelligence. If let's say one of your suppliers is gonna go to market with you, then they wanna score you and they wanna know what's the likely probability of you being successful. So you're being measured and monitored at the same time. The other thing to think about is how do you compare with other companies in a benchmark world that are similar to you? So if a Salesforce partner logs in and says, this is what I look like compared to the top five Salesforce partners that look like me and act like me or in the same uh, area that I'm in, um, and I'm looks like I'm not in the top five, so what is it gonna take me to get to the top five? So that engine can create a prescriptive model that can tell that partner what the steps are that they have to go through in terms of adding resources, adding people, adding capacity, um, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe they're not making a profit. Maybe they have too many people that are on the bench. There's a number of different things to look at. And then the other thing I would offer to you as you, as you look at companies to come in and, and talk with you about um, artificial intelligence, um, there's going to be a couple of questions they ask. And this is a way to tell if a, if a consulting company pretty much knows what they're talking about. If they walk in and the first question out of their mouth uses the words what or where, they likely are not going to understand the hows and whys of what you need to get done from an AI perspective. Oh, Lee, that's not that sounds like a pretty uh, a pretty clear cut filter uh, to begin to understand who the people I can reach out to can help me and whether or not they can actually help me with this or not. I think so. We, that's what we've seen over over the uh, the times that we've been doing this, and we've been working in this space for probably ten years. We've been doing uh, prescriptive models uh, to prescribe to a sales force the next step to take to close deals. It really suggests that the leaders themselves almost have to go through a, a mentality or a headset change in order to embrace and incorporate some of these capabilities that are now out there. They do. And it's going to take some education. And, you know, they're great places. Uh, this webinar is a great example of that. The others are just simply go to YouTube and, get you know, take a look at some of the YouTube videos that are out there on AI. And, and uh, I know for myself, I decided to, to go and and learn Power BI. There's 150 labs on Power BI, and it took me five days to go through those. But it's going to take investment. 
somebody's going to have to sit down and go through it and get knowledgeable about it. Well, Lee, it would take most of us probably five weeks to get through what you got through in five days, but we appreciate the concept. So thank you for that. Uh, Lori, let me shift to you now. Uh, you get exposed to a lot of folks out there. Your organization touches and engages so many folks. Um, talk to us about real world examples you've seen in small and mid-sized business where AI is beginning to make a difference for folks. Lori? Oh, sorry about that. I was on mute. <laughs> I think Marco and Lee mentioned a couple of them already, but uh, you know, I think um, this talent management area and Lee mentioned um, dice, but we're really seeing, you know, that there's a real talent shortage or even crisis. And when you can't, you know, fill those open positions or keep your employees, we're seeing a lot of the applications in the talent management space really using AI to deliver some great results. And I think sourcing the right candidates, as Lee said, is really an area where we're seeing this across the board, not just in DICE, but really the vendors are using um, AI and machine learning to help you match kind of the best prospects to the job by you know, observing the patterns and profiles of the successful employees in your company that are in those roles. So you can use that information to create better job postings that are going to help you attract the right candidates, you know, right out the gate. And, and then also putting in things, using things like um, in applicant screening and scheduling and selection, you know, using the AI and machine learning to help you sift through all those applications and, you know, identify the best ones, uh, you know, more quickly, which today is really time consuming because you might have information about a candidate in lots of different places, you know, their resumes, their professional networks, their LinkedIn profile, everything like that. So the AI and the machine learning tools can pull that data together and screen and get better and better at screening candidates um, to meet requirements on, on the job. And another area that a lot of companies, and there's been a lot of press about this, and you know, as I said earlier, it's humans inventing these algorithms. So you, you kind of have to make sure you're you're getting the results you want, but it's in reducing bias. So, um, you know, having uh, both the unconscious and conscious types of bias, a screening tool, you can program that to say, ignore things like age or gender or ethnic origin. Um, so that can help you, you know, obviously be more uh, diverse in the business and help you get the best candidates as opposed to, you know, your view of, oh, well, doesn't, isn't it always a guy that's going to be the engineer or something like that? So there are definitely a lot of things. Another big area is security. So you, you probably don't even know it, but a lot of the companies that are providing security solutions are using a lot of AI and machine learning to look for anonymous activities. So things that are kind of outside the bounds of what's normal, whether it's on a device or you know, using biometrics, um, just your patterns of behavior when you're logging on and off, how long you look at things. So all that kind of stuff is being built into these solutions. So I, I think there are a lot of applications already today where, where you may be getting some benefit from it and not even realizing it. Well, you know, Laura, you touched on cybersecurity, and, and the point there is that the, the tools on the defensive side are there, and that's important because the tools exist on the offensive side as well. But once hackers get inside your system, they then use their AI capabilities to read and understand all your attributes and all your behaviors. So when the CFOs in Europe and the CEOs in Asia and some request for $300,000 for equipment comes through and someone hits send, that money disappears. Uh, right. AI show up in a lot of different ways. Uh, but it's, it's interesting that you connected it back to the cyber issue. Yeah, and I mean, yes, that's right, because they're they're automating fraud, right? The fraudsters are all over this too. So it really, you know, as these security solutions come, become more advanced, they're going to look at how you interact with the keyboard, your phone, wearable devices. You know, how fast you are doing things with, you know, your your keystrokes or how you look at pages. And then they're going to be able to build better and better user profiles. And if somebody tries doing something on your device that isn't really diving with your normal behavior, 
it's going to provide a better check on security. It has to be almost an individual version of what you see with your credit card, where the credit card companies are always flashing you for, you know, is this, is this you buying this here type, type requests? Yep. Good. Well, great. Listen, uh, so we got some examples here uh, from, from Marco, from Lee, from Lori, about where and how artificial intelligence is actually uh, evolving and being used and, and beginning to provide value to folks. It leads us to our third section which is to really get into, I wanted to, what I thought we would do is review the recommendations that we assembled based on the research we did, the members and the experts we talked to, and then give each one of our experts a chance to come back and either comment on that or build on that with recommendations because uh, it's important that folks realize that artificial intelligence is coming and only you can decide when that right timing is for you. What we wanted to do with this, with this report, with this webinar, is to give you a broad understanding of what it is, how it's being used, and now some of the recommendations. So you can then decide how on your terms and when on your terms, uh, it becomes a good decision. So let's start with the first element of this, which is strategy. And the concept here is, is don't look for ways where artificial intelligence can be used. Rather, look for questions, the simple questions that you're trying to solve and let artificial intelligence support the strategy versus be the strategy. And we heard, um, we heard uh, Mark, I think, talk about the yes-no questions. Identify what those easy questions are first and use that as a starting point. Uh, artificial intelligence will be an absolute journey and evolution over time. As you learn more, as the technology advances, as you get more data, it will continue to evolve. But the point here is to start with strategy and start simple. Next up is data. And I know Lee talked about data, and, and data has been an underlying current throughout this whole thing. Uh, whenever we talk about technology, we have to talk about data. So you need to look for areas where you have lots of data that you can begin to apply these powerful capabilities. Uh, but then it gets us back to the same old problem of bad data. Uh, we have to clean up our data. Processing bad data faster, better, quicker only gives us worse answers faster. And that's what we're trying to get to. It's the, the appreciation that data is your most valuable resource. And this again connects back to cyber, but it's your most important resource, your customer data, your financial data, which includes all your products and all your orders, and then, of course, uh, your employee data. Uh, and then collect data. Go find the data if you don't have it. Find it in areas that are of importance to you and that will inform you in decision making. Our next is the technology and systems, and you heard this consistently, and that is that as a small and mid-sized business, you're probably not going to be able to afford nor be able to hire your own personal data scientists. Rather, look for the AI that exists in your application. Lean on experts like the, folk at sales, like the folks at Salesforce that Marco talks about or the other vendors who have capabilities that can help you understand what you're already doing can begin to exploit what exists inside and what exists with these capabilities to begin to find some of those trends and opportunities. You know, we talked, Lori touched on the talent crisis that is that everyone's dealing with. 87% of our CEOs have talent as one of their top three decisions that they're facing. And the concept here is look for repetitive tasks that you can automate, not to eliminate those people, but to free those people up to use the more creative, value-add, customer-facing type capabilities. And then as you think about this, again, we talked about this earlier, but looking at in the manufacturing space specifically, look at the equipment that you have and look to add sensors versus upgrading to that next generation machine that would already have those sensors embedded and then pull that into your controls. And then the last element is, is expertise. Um, there's no expectation that any of us should be experts in, in AI. Uh, again, the, the types of uh, IT staffs that we have, uh, those folks are dealing in small and mid-sized business, dealing with so many issues that you really need to think about engaging an expert, be that expertise in the applications that you have or expertise in terms of what you want to do and, and where you think it might help you drive your business. Um, and I appreciate the fact that this is a, an absolute journey that you will always be adjusting and adapting. Um, and it's really just a question of when you start on AI and when you don't. So these are the recommendations that we pulled through from all the interviews and all the research that we did. But I wanted to come back to our experts once again uh, and get a perspective from them on, on what do you think, what are the, what are the recommendations? Uh, Lee, let's start with you. But what are the, the recommendations you would give people who want to get started and get going on this um, that, that is going to help them the most? First, educate yourself. Uh, take the time to go through webinars like this. Uh, look for the problems that, that will make the most impact to your company uh, from a financial standpoint. I would probably focus, if it were me, I would focus on the revenue side and figure out what can I do to drive the revenue and make sure that whatever you do is paying for the project that you're, that you're dealing with. And then the next thing I would look at is what is my data? Do I have the data to solve my problem? Do I have it internally? Can I create it? Um, what is it going to cost me to create it if I don't have it? And um, 
then what is my expected outcome? Uh, and those would be the, the, the approaches that I would take. Well, Lee, to drill into this data issue, because we've all got lots of data. I've individually have got a whole pile of data on my computer and, and small and mid-sized businesses as well have lots of data. Um, it's clear that at some point in time, we're gonna have to cross the clean the data bridge. Is AI going to be that forcing function uh, that's gonna get us to go back and look at the 20, 30 years of data that we've, we've collected and clogged? Or do you think people will just you know, uh, pick a, a point in time and, and go forward from that and erase everything back in the past? I think there's gonna have to be some formality to cleaning the data. Uh, there's some mechanisms. If you look at EDI today, EDI forces data to be transmitted in a form that the guy on the other end can consume. I think that will find itself back into mainstream uh, business where if you're going to transmit a purchase order, then a purchase order is a purchase order is a purchase order and you don't care where it comes from. It just has to be in the same format every time. And if it doesn't get to me in the format that I need, I'm going to send it back to you until you get it to me in the format that I need. So there will be consumption engines that will be used to shape the data and to filter it. So when you get it in your system of record, that it's going to be clean. Now, I would, I would, that, that's a whole, a whole area called master data management, but I would attempt to isolate my bad data outside my uh, engines to do AI and only let through what is the appropriate data, um, clean data to work from. So there's, there's mechanisms to do that and there are processes to do that. Well, it's, it's clear that before I can step into AI, I have to get my data straight. So that's an important uh, important. <laughs> Lori, let's go to you. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on recommendations? How would you help people uh, to get their heads around this and, and, and maybe to get started or if, they're, if they are started, how to get mm -hmm. to the next level? Well, I, I certainly agree with everything Lee said. And I also think that, um, you know, start by looking at the application. You know, when, when you, you do want to figure out your pain points first. What What is the area that I can uh, really, if I get more information, it's really going to, help me make much better decisions that are going to give me much better outcomes. And um, once you do that, you know, take a look at, well, how, how am I addressing this area today? What vendors am I relying on? What, what am I using in this area? Because what we often find is a lot of smaller businesses, they don't even know what the capabilities are and the solutions they already use that they're already paying for. And I think you're going to find that in some instances, certainly with Salesforce, um, but a lot of the vendors um, out there, they're already putting some of these capabilities in. And in addition to the importance of cleaning up your own data, which is, is definitely key, some of them are also starting to clean up data and taxonomy. So for instance, in the skills tax taxonomy, you know, there's millions of different terms for different job skills. So a uh, vendor called Workday has narrow, already narrowed that from 2 million terms down to 55,000. So if you use their solution, it's going to help you aggregate under a tighter taxonomy. Um, the other thing to think about is that, yeah, your data is really important, but if you're a small business, you may also be wanting to benchmark yourself uh, against competitors in your industry, in your area, similar size, shape, color, exact, you know, whatever. And um, some of the vendors now, and I'll, I'll go back to Intuit because these are very small businesses. You may not have enough data on your own to really make adv take advantage of AR and, and machine learning. But a lot of vendors are starting to have an opt-in. So your data, data is aggregated and anonymized but it will give you a lot of capabilities because you'll be able to look at your individual data versus the data across a more, you know, a bigger, more aggregated group and get some really great insights too. So I think start with what you're already using and I think Marco already said that and really make sure that some of the problems you want to address, you may find a mechanism to address that, at least start addressing it. Um, and then you can, you know, take steps to do more advanced things, but kind of start with what you know. Otherwise, it's overwhelming. Lori, we saw earlier that 73% of Visage members are investing in business applications and software. What are the one or two questions they should ask to probe what level or what capabilities AI might exist in, in whatever that, that application they're choosing is are? 
Yeah, I, I would say, you know, show, show me the money. Show me <laughs> what you what you have, you know, you know, you those those god awful tasks that you're doing in in that era of your business, like uh, I don't know, processing expense reports or you know, something that's just a huge time sink for your company, and you think there's got to be a better way to do this, or an area where you know you're falling behind in terms of you know building your business. But whatever it is, say, show me how your application is is using AI and machine learning to take the friction out of this and enable me to offload those really horrible redundant tasks so that my people can focus on the higher value stuff that's really going to move the business ahead. But show me how that works. Show me, show me the application. That's what you're saying. Show me, right? yeah, show me the application and show me the money because if I'm, if I'm going to invest in something, I want to know at the end of the day, this is really going to take friction out of my life and give that time back to doing the strategic things to grow the business. And that same concept can be applied to your existing vendors. Pick up the phone, call them up and say, help me understand how your capabilities and your embedded AI, how I can leverage mm -hmm. that based on our existing relationship. Absolutely. And the, and the last thing, and I think um, Lee or Marco mentioned this, but I'll, I'll echo it. If you're running applications that are not in the cloud, now is really the time to think about it if you want to go to the cloud because I, I can tell you most small and medium businesses will not be able to do this on their own with on-premises solutions. Yeah, it's just going to be too too gargantuan a task. Well, that's clear. Well, let's let's then turn to Marco. Marco, bring us home. Uh, what are your recommendations? What are your comments? You know, what would you like to share with our community about how they get started and then once they're started, how they can really really rev this thing up and make it meaningful? You probably see as much Great. of this well, as you're, given, the, given the exposure you have with Salesforce and Essentials. I see it all the time, certainly. Uh, if you're looking for a problem that would be a good problem to solve with AI, look no further than your own reports and dashboards, wherever you do those things, in Excel and Salesforce and Power BI, wherever that might be, every business everywhere has a set of KPIs, key performance indicators that they're tracking closely, that they're looking at every day. Look at those. Those are the kinds of places where you can seek to add predictions. So whenever you can report on it looking backwards, you may want to predict that going forward. But when you do so, as I said earlier, try to formulate the most concrete and simple question that you can to answer. So for example, let's say that one of your KPIs is how long it takes people to pay their bills and whether they pay them late or on time. Now, there's a couple of different ways that you can ask that question. You can say, how many days is it going to take you to pay your bill? Or you can say, is it going to be late or not? The latter question is the better question to start with. Because as I said earlier, the more concrete your question is, the more likely you are to get an accurate answer. So if you have a choice, Choose the yes and no question first. And finally, as the other two panelists said, uh, you apply your AI and your machine learning to where the data is. And to reiterate, for many SMBs, that is most frequently found in marketing. So marketing is the on-ramp to AI. So you can often look there for a place where you can get started with those tools and technologies. Well, and it's not like anybody, not everybody doesn't have a problem trying to find new customers. So it's clear that's an on-ramp for everybody that they can, they can engage. Thank you so much for that. Um, let's bring this home. We had a chance to, uh, to think about it, and hopefully you were able to get some practical applications, how to get started, some recommendations. We sought to understand what this concept is. We had some amazing examples of great insight stories about what's happening. And then we just heard not just the recommendations that we teased out, but some great insights from our members or from our, our panelists here. I think it's safe to say that, as we said before, artificial intelligence is in your future. Uh, whether that's tomorrow, next week, or a year from now is entirely up to you based on your business and how you can leverage the powerful computers and the, and the data that you have in order to get to these better questions. I think fundamentally that artificial intelligence is neither artificial nor intelligence. It's rather uh, massively powerful computers processing big, big piles of data at ludicrous speeds. And the key to it, as we've heard multiple times, is the question, the algorithm. So just as the CEO in the 1930s, much of his success or her success was based upon asking great questions, 
our success going forward and our success with artificial intelligence will once again be tied to our ability to ask questions and to know that the questions, that the data that is being used to answer the questions is good data. I hope you found today's event uh, thought provoking. Uh, I hope it gave you some ideas to get started and we look forward to working with you going forward. I'd like to thank our, our uh, panelists again, Lee Blackstone. Uh, thank you so much, Lee, for your time. Contact information is here. Uh, Lee and, and Blackstone and Cohen are always interested in talking with you. Marco, thank you so much for your time. I know how much in demand you are uh, at Salesforce and all the amazing work you're doing with Einstein. We look forward to hearing and learning from you in the forward. And Lori, as always, um, I look to you as the sage and the oracle for all things technology when it comes to SMB. So thank you to each one of our panelists. And with that, um, I'd invite you, you can download this report. It is available in your GoToMeeting uh, screen under the handouts, or you can go to Vistage.com slash AI dash report and download it there. You can also go to the Vistage Research Center at Vistage.com and look at our other reports, including we mentioned cyber a few times, uh, but cyber's there. And you can download that report and take a look at that. Um, Vistage Research, it's our pleasure to host this and to do this research. You know, our goal is to become the Vistage uh, become the CEO, the SMB CEO's most trusted resource for research data and expert perspectives on the issues, topics, and decisions of business optimization and leadership enhancement. And we depend on our community of experts that exist uh, in, with our speakers, with our sponsors, with our chairs, with our members, and our extended community. And we look forward to providing you with more information and do more research as we go forward. And finally, um, oops, sorry, there we go. Finally, I'd like to invite you to, to mark Friday, December 14th for our next Fridays with Vistage webinar. Uh, that will be on Talent Imperatives, featuring our good friend Kathleen Quinn Votel, talking about the challenges of talent that we alluded to earlier. Um, we will be collecting your questions, and we will be responding to your questions as an attachment when we send out to you a recording of this, of this webinar. So I'd like to say thank you very much for your time and attention. Hopefully, we got you to think differently or think in a fresh sense about what artificial intelligence is and how it can be for you. And we look forward to continuing to study its evolution and, and how it changes and, and drives business in our world uh, as we go forward. So this is Joe Galvin with Vistage Research. On behalf of all of Vistage, we'd like to say thank you for listening and look forward to our next opportunity to provide value to you as it relates to issues, topics, and decisions of business optimization and leadership enhancement. Thank you very much.